Welcome to Lacrosse Recruiting 101, where the biggest names in lacrosse share their inside views and expertise. Now, your host, Luke Cometti. In this episode of the podcast, I talk with Pete Toner, Associate Head Coach at Penn State University, entering his 10th season. Prior to Penn State, Pete was the Associate Head Coach at Bryant University for three seasons and the Head Coach at Wheaton College for two seasons. During the podcast, Pete talks about the process and what it took over the years to bring Penn State to a top program in the nation and how that recent success has helped their recruiting. He also dives into what they look for in recruits as a staff, where they look for the recruits, and some reasons you as a player may want to attend Penn State University. If I miss something, or there's something you would like to hear on the next podcast, then please email us at questions at lacrosserecruiting101.com or tweet at our Twitter handle at laxrecruit101. Thanks for tuning in. Pete Toner, Associate Head Coach, Penn State University Men's Lacrosse. Thank you for coming on the podcast. You bet. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And I'm excited to have you on because this past season was a big one for Penn State men's lacrosse, you know, being ranked number one for many consecutive weeks, especially towards the end of the season, first ever final four appearance in program history. I mean, Penn State's always had a solid program, but I think after this past season, you guys have really shown that you are now a top lacrosse program in the country. Can you start out maybe by talking with us about that process and how you got to this point? I know you've been there for almost 10 years and maybe how you and coach Tambroni have changed the culture, maybe change your recruiting style or even things you've done on and off the field to get to where you are now. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no doubt it's taken us some time. Um, probably would have you know, looked back about five years ago and hoped that we had, you know, been able to get to this point a little bit sooner, but um, you know, there were definitely some hurdles during these, you know, nine to 10 years that we've, uh, been able to overcome. Um, you know, I think you already hit on it, the culture piece. That is a huge part of the success we had on last year's team. And I don't think it was just about last year's team. I do look back two and three years ago um, at some of our graduated seniors and give those guys a lot of credit for really kind of changing the traje trajectory of our program as it relates to the culture. Um, you know, we talk a lot about here about having a championship culture and kind of a championship mindset. And there was never really any um, – you know, visual evidence of what that even looked like. Um, yeah. Fortunately, last year we were able to win a championship. We were able to win in the Big Ten. We were able to get to the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, we learned a lot from our 2017 team that got into the NCAA tournament and, and kind of fell flat in our eyes, so to speak. Um, so we were able to take a lot of that experience um, from that team um, and build off it with last year's seniors that were, um, I believe, freshmen at the time. And, um, you know, those guys were just really motivated. And they were motivated to – to change the culture, to get it where it needs to be, um, to focus a little bit more on the, the things within our program that maybe were just a little off kilter um, to, to allow us to have a little bit more success on the field, certainly off the field, uh, become a more consistent program. Um, and I do think that that stuff showed up on the field last year, um, you know, along with some pretty talented players. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We, um, you know, recruited some guys that, you know, maybe weren't the um, – you know, number one, number two, number three recruits in the country coming out of high school, but over the course of their career, they've worked extremely hard to become some of the best players in the country at their position. You know, a, a Grant Amen comes to mind, a, a Mac O'Keefe, a Chris Sabia. Um, you know, those guys weren't highly touted recruits coming out of high school, um, but they've just continued to keep their head down and work the right way um, and buy into our culture. And uh, I think it's paid dividends for all of us, um, certainly on the field. So. Absolutely. And you, you almost see that a lot. You have these high ranked recruits coming out of high school and some of them do pan out and are very good college players, but sometimes you don't hear anything from them in college. And then you get these players that never even made a top recruiting list who are the all Americans. So it's really a crapshoot, and it's kind of, you know, if you're able to find that as a recruiter, I guess that's something special and that's something you're probably looking for in your program. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, um, you know, we talk a lot about the right fit. Um, we've, we've, we've learned over time what works here at Penn State. Um, you know, again, it's one of the bigger schools.
schools in the country. There's 41,000 plus students. Um, you know, you got to really find guys that want to be here for the right reasons. Um, you know, I think having guys that are extremely disciplined is a real, um, a real key asset that we look for in recruiting. I and mean, we do a lot of research on the kids that we invite into our program and into our lacrosse family. And, uh, you know, a big part of it is just getting guys that are the right fit for our culture. Um, and again, there's a lot of distractions at a place like Penn State. There's a lot of positive distractions, but there's also some that could, you know, pull guys in a different direction at times. And, yeah. you know, you got to be really disciplined at a place like this to, to go through the protocol that we have in place for these guys um, year-round. Um, there's certainly a lot of time to have fun, but when it's time to, to get to work and to improve, um, you know, finding guys that are right fit in that regard. And we've, we've definitely kind of honed in on some areas of the country that we've had a lot of success recruiting guys from, um, certain programs that we've had a lot of success uh, recruiting guys from. Um, you know, we're certainly willing to go outside of those areas, but, you know, we kind of know what works for us here over the course of time, or maybe our earlier years, we didn't necessarily know. It was like, Hey, let's just, we need talent. We need talent now. And maybe we didn't, um, take all the right kids as early as we could have, um, uh, you know, when we first got to Penn State. So, um, that's, that's been a, le- a learning curve for Coach Tambroni and myself. And he was at Cornell. I was at Bryant. Now we're both at Penn State. Two totally different, or three totally different types of programs. Um, and then finding what works best for us and fits best for us has been the real key over these last few years. How has the recent success helped your recruiting maybe this past summer and into the fall? Yeah, I mean, we're going through the September 1 thing really for the first time. I know we did it last year, um, but we had a class committed to us prior to the rule change. Um, Unfortunately, just weren't able to talk to those kids for a year and a half. So there's definitely been some changeover with that 2020 group. Um, With the 2021s, I mean, it seems like we, you know, we, we are starting to get a lot of kids from some different areas or maybe some different programs to really take a good hard look at Penn State, knowing what they saw in the field last year. Um, everybody wants to be a part of a winner. There's no surprise there. Um, I do think, you know, our, our facility upgrades have definitely helped. I mean, having Panzer Stadium be on TV now and seeing the atmosphere that a Penn State lacrosse game can provide and seeing the style that we play, being in the Big Ten, getting on TV, um, you know, six, seven, eight times a year has really given us a lot of exposure. And I do think that there's a pretty good buzz right now. Um, and, you know, I think back to when I was growing up with some of the, the, the college players, you know, that were playing the game, like a Gary Gate or, or a Paul Gate or, you know, those names in college across. So I've kind of gotten to a point where a Grant Amen or a Mac O'Keefe are pretty recognizable names. And some of these kids are, are starting to know who our guys are. And that wasn't always the case here. Um, so when our best players are, um, you know, continuing on to play in the pro league or our, um, you know, gaining some notoriety uh, through their efforts on the field, it definitely has helped um, just get the word out about what Penn State lacrosse is all about and the direction that we're headed. So it's uh, it's all been positive from a recruiting standpoint coming off a great season. So you guys even had a prospect day earlier this fall, and I'm sure all this success has helped boost those numbers. And I guess how, how did that go this year? And Almost, you know, what are your goals as a staff when you put on these prospect days? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for the kids that we wanted there, we did get a good number of them to show up. Um, the one thing looking back on, if we had to do it all over again, like we'll do another one in January. The timing of it was a little bit challenging just because a lot of these kids finished uh, summer lacrosse towards the tail end of July. And yeah. Then they basically took a month off in August. Uh, a lot of them are playing fall sports. So you figure if you're doing something on a Sunday in September, there's a there's probably 75% of your list of kids that you may have invited that either had a football game Saturday or Friday night or they're, you know, they have a potential practice on a Sunday, um, you know, or they're in soccer or whatever the case may be. So the timing of it, probably a little bit of a challenge that we'll definitely look into um, into the future. We did get some great kids to show up, um, you know, certainly in the 21 class, definitely some some really talented, um, you know, 2022s in that next recruiting class showed up. Um, so it was it was certainly beneficial um, for us to, to have those kids on campus. I mean, it's a, it's a great indicator of who's interested in your school. So that's priority number one. Um, it's a great opportunity to coach these kids to see who can take to a little bit of coaching, who can absorb a little bit of coaching. Um, and then it, it's also just a great opportunity for us to just have kids to Penn State. I mean, they get to use our stadium, um, see our facilities, you know, sit in the film room for the initial meeting, um, kind of get a mini tour of campus without having it be a formal 
um, organized ordeal. Um, Catch a football you know, game, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a football game. The Pitt, the Pitt Penn State game had 107,000 people out the day before. Uh, so that atmosphere <laughs> awesome. was electric, as you can imagine. Um, you know, the tailgating scene and, and all that goes with the Penn State home football game. Um, and then just the ability to be around campus, you know, to, to take a tour around in the car with mom and dad or get out and walk around. Um, you know, it was like beautiful weather, 75 degrees, 80 degrees, and it's still early September. So it's a pretty neat time of year to be on uh, a big um, college campus and then have the lacrosse part of it be like the last uh, the lasting impression that you leave with, with was pretty special. So, Do you have any advice to a player who is exploring prospect days? You know, as a high school coach, I get questions all the time about which ones to attend. A lot of programs put on prospect days, and it seems like you could go to five of them or you could go to 20 of them. But sometimes that's not always, you know, feasible and it's not able, especially if you're traveling. You know, it's tough for these families to get to a lot of them. Do you have any advice on which ones to choose or how to choose them and maybe some expectations or things to keep in mind when they are there? Yeah, I mean, I think, Having a realistic list of schools is something that I would definitely encourage younger kids to to keep in mind. I mean, listen, everyone would love to go to to Duke, Virginia, Carolina, Penn State, you know, you name it. Um, you know, I, I played Division three lacrosse, you know what I mean? So it was one of those things where um, having a realistic list of schools based on information that your high school coach is providing to you, maybe your club coach is providing to you, um, you know, See who's, who's, who's contacting you. I think that's usually a pretty good indicator of the types of schools you should be looking at. So if you're getting emailed by every school in the Big Ten, their prospect camps information, then you should probably be going to one of those prospect camps. But if you're getting um, emailed by, um, you know, schools in the NESCAC or the ODAC in Division Three, maybe those are the schools you should be looking at. Um, you know, in terms of cost and travel, it never hurts to go and jump to the, um, a staff that you might, think could be a long shot and show them what you got and maybe you have the opportunity after that but you also have to be realistic with what you're looking at in terms of kind of who's recruiting you at that time um, schools that you really do have genuine interest in I mean if you you know have a 2-0 GPA and you're going to you know Yale prospect camp probably not a great idea so um, <laughs> you know I would just stay realistic with the types of schools that you're interested in the type of feedback that you're getting from your high school and club coach based on the level that you should you could probably play at. Um, and then when you get there, I would just say be yourself. Don't try to be something that you're not. Um, control what you can control, which is your effort. Um, you know, your willingness to be a really good teammate, um, not be a selfish player. You want to show your strengths, but you also, you know, you want to show that you can be a team guy as well with a bunch of strangers, really. I mean, kids that you may or may not even know. And it could be a five-hour camp. And by the end of it, um, you know, you might meet – five or six kids that you're either from your from around your hometown or kids you played club or high school across against. But quite frankly, you're there by yourself on an island. And, and, you know, I would certainly encourage you to just be yourself while you're there and control what you can. So that would be my advice to anyone who does go to any prospect camp. I do think it's a great way for college coaches to know whether or not a kid is interested. If he shows up, he's obviously interested. And then if he shows up and plays really well, that could lead to the next step, which would be potentially adding you to a list or a database or depending on your age, bringing you right back to campus for an actual visit. So I do think if you pick the right schools and you, and you play well during those events, it could be really beneficial for both sides. Now, you did say it's a good idea to maybe go to a prospect day of a program that has showed interest. Define interest because some parents and players will say, yeah, I received an email about this prospect day, but I don't know if it got sent out to 100 kids or to 1,000 kids. You know, what, yeah, what level be, of interest would kind of, okay, at least they're looking at me. Yeah. I mean, I think some of those, I mean, I'm only speaking from, from my experience at Penn State, like we, we don't make money off of prospect camps. So some schools do, some schools will, will generate a lot of financing from those camps. So if a hundred kids show up and they all pay two or $300 for the day, whatever it is, I mean, there's a pretty sizable chunk of money there that they may be paying their volunteer assistant with or their second assistant with. Um, Penn State just runs it a little bit differently because the camp office owns everything that we do here. So it's just a totally different setup. So um, the benefit for us is really to get kids that we've seen evaluated and liked to campus. Um, I would say if it's coming from the coach, um, it's probably genuine that they saw you at some point and 
added you to a database and put your took the time to type your email in and then eventually take the time to email you that invite. Um, you know, if it's coming from a recruiting service or something that doesn't look like it's directly from one of the staff members, um, it may just be, hey, we just threw a thousand emails in and just sent it off and it's, it's more of a money grab. Um, yeah. So I would just be, you know, looking into that. I would also communicate with your high school or club coach because most of us will have reached out to them and say, hey, we really like Johnny. What do you think of him? Uh, I think he's a great kid. He's a great athlete. Okay, great. We're going to send him a camp, um, a prospect camp invite, and we'd love to have him. You know, that sort of a thing. So, um, you know, that, that could also be a way to figure out if you do get some of these prospect camp invites to maybe reach out to your coach. Say, hey, just by the way, have you heard from Penn State about me? Have they asked or inquired? And if we have, then maybe there's a good chance that we'd, you know, be a, a potential suitor for, for one of those prospect camp uh, opportunities. So. Yeah, makes sense. But outside of prospect days, the ones you guys put on, what other type of events do you and the staff attend? Or at least, you know, what do you mostly attend? Like recruiting tournaments with club teams, individual showcases, or even high school team events? We do a little bit of everything. Um, Again, we try to follow around the best um, teams and talent that we can find. Um, So there's a pretty good variety. Um, There's certain recruiting tournaments that year after year um, are staples that we just always go back to because we've we've seen the benefit of being at those and evaluating the kids that are there. Um, You know, the Under Armour Games as an individual showcase type camp has definitely taken off um, to be one of the bigger events of the summer. Uh, I know Maverick is another one that's an individual event um, that has definitely taken off to be one of the bigger events of summer that most coaches will attend. Um, I do like the high school event because it does, show you playing with your high school teammates, being coached by your high school coach. Um, maybe it, it shows a different side of the way you play um, versus the club um, scene where you may just be one of, you know, a number of guys or, hey, you always are the lefty attacking for this particular club team. And then maybe in your high school team, you're playing some midfield um, or, or whatever the case may be. So I do, I do like to watch kids play with their high school team because it does give you a true sense of probably what you're getting more often than not than the club team where they may just be, you know, paying to be that club team and they're, you're, they're just automatically in a position to play just because that's what they're paying for. So um, those, those two things are a little bit different, but at the end of the day, the, the talent and, and the athleticism is going to shine uh, regardless as long as you're out there playing as hard as you can. Um, so all, all those events are pretty, uh, pretty beneficial if the right kids are at them. Yeah. And you, you touched on this earlier, that you guys kind of honed in to where you pull a bulk of your recruits. Where does that tend to be? You know, is that in Pennsylvania, seeing as Penn State is a state school? And now you've said you're even more open to expanding that kind of horizon of where you're pulling recruits from. You know, where maybe are some new places where you're starting to look that you haven't looked in the past? Well, if you look at, you know, we do this a lot. You look at a map. I mean, we're in the middle of central, or or obviously central Pennsylvania. We're in the middle of the state. So if you do like a seven-hour bubble, like kind of northeast of here, I mean, you think about that, that is the northeast of of the lacrosse hotbed. I mean, that's going to get you up into New England. It's going to get you into upstate New York. It's going to get you into Canada. It's going to get you down as far down as, you know, northern Virginia. Um, Certainly, um, you know, New Jersey, Long Island, um, D.C., Baltimore. I mean, it is a pretty um, good location to be in as far as recruiting for lacrosse yeah. um, because everything is within like kind of three and a half hour drive to seven hour drive. Um, it's a day trip if you if you want it to be for those areas of the country. And obviously there's a lot of good lacrosse players in that area of the country. We definitely get into Philly as early as we can. Um, there's a lot of talent there. And like you said, it's in-state uh, tuition. It's a lot of Penn State families, um, so maybe mom went to Penn State, dad went to Penn State, aunts, uncles, cousins. You know, there's a lot of Philadelphia area kids that just naturally end up here. Um, so that is usually kind of our first stop as far as recruiting goes to figure out who the best kids in that area are. Um, and then as far as just branching out, I mean, our starting goalie is from Texas, Colby Kines. Um We have some kids on the roster. Um, we have a face-up guy that's committed to us from Nevada. We have a kid, a couple of kids on the roster from Colorado. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to expand. Um, again, there, there's so many good lacrosse players in the Northeast that we kind of focus on first. 
and we only take about 11 or 12 kids in every class. So sometimes we fill the class up before we even have the opportunity to recruit those kids from the West Coast. But, you know, we're certainly not not recruiting those kids. Um, it just tends to sometimes work out for us a little bit better um, just with the, the natural proximity to the to the kids in the Northeast. So um, we're definitely trying. We're trying to get to the West Coast. I know the West Coast Stars is a great program. Um, you know, there's some, some Texas teams that are very good. Florida is getting very good. So we're definitely trying to expand our recruiting footprint a little bit. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we're kind of staying in that Northeast, like Northern Virginia, all the way up to Massachusetts uh, bubble, and then certainly into Canada. Yeah, that's a great point that you guys are kind of in an ideal location as far as historically where it tends to be, you know, lacrosse hotbed. I mean, it seems like even all those recruiting events are right there, kind of Philly, Baltimore area, which is an easy day trip for you guys. So I can yep, see why you, you tend to stick there. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Iron Horse Lacrosse, the number one lacrosse program in Texas for travel teams, camps, and clinics. For more information on Iron Horse, visit their website at www.ironhorselax.com. Um, next question. I, well, actually, I just want you to fill in the blank here. You know, when you're at a recruiting event, if a high school player does blank, he will not be recruited by Penn State. And a little caveat to that statement being that he has maybe the ability to play there, but you're not going to recruit him because of this reason. Um, I mean, I think one one kind of easy one is if you just you just notice lazy tendencies. If the kid's lazy, um, doesn't ride very hard. Um, kind of throws the ball at the goal and then jogs back on defense, um, you know, kind of shows tendencies of just not being a very good teammate um, and is a little bit selfish in that regard. I think that would probably be one. Um, you know, those, those are things that you can kind of, you can pick out pretty quickly when you watch a kid play, especially the amount of times we see these kids play. I mean, you could see one kid play in a summer 20 different times. And if every time you see him, you see these tendencies, that's probably going to get you crossed off the list. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, you've been coaching for such a long time and watching all these recruiting events. Give me two or three things that you believe high school players could improve on as a whole. And that could be specific to defense and offense, but just a couple things that you notice consistently that guys could improve on or maybe need to improve on. Um, you know, I do think that unfortunately because of the way that the the club world has taken over I think a lot of kids just want to play games like they just want to show up and play and I do think that taking an instruction um, is kind of a lost art at this point I mean I think these kids start playing club lacrosse at such a young age that they just show up scrimmage or show up and maybe do a little bit of drill work and then and then just play um, just play is great I mean there's times that we'll just play with our guys and just say hey let's roll a ball out there and scrimmage but the ability to to understand how the game should really work um understanding um the sport is a real a real kind of key in our opinion um you know i do think going to instructional camps as tedious as it may be and as as the you know it's not it's not playing club lacrosse but um you know working with um you know instruction working with your coaches like can you improve your craft are you playing wall ball are you constantly working on your craft to become a better lacrosse player or is it hey i just want to show up and play games um play my three three games in one day and then go back to the hotel and jump in the pool and then do the same thing the next day um i do think there's a lot of kids that probably aren't getting coached as well as they should be or could be um and that would be an area that i would just stress upon um you know high school kids a play multiple sports because you're going to constantly learn from um, just how to be an athlete by being in different situations, whether it's football, basketball, lacrosse, or it's football, hockey, lacrosse, or soccer, hockey, lacrosse, whatever it is, that's going to force you to, to learn how to just be a good athlete and read and react to situations that happen in those sports. Um, you're going to be on a team, so it's going to teach you how to be a good teammate, which is huge. Um, that's one of the, the key things that we look for when we recruit young men. Um, and you're going to constantly be competing. Um, that's a, that's a big thing. So the guys that just do, year round lacrosse and they're, you know, they're only doing skill sessions, but they're not competing more than just a little bit in the fall and then in their spring season and maybe during the summer, they're losing a lot of opportunities to keep that edge during the fall, um, you know, where you could be playing football every day or during the winter where you could be playing ice hockey or wrestling every day. I mean, just the ability to compete um, 
along with the skill development, I think are, are two things that I would definitely encourage, um, you know, high school players to look into. And the other side of this is, is the weight room side. I know sometimes it's a little early for certain kids, but the amount of information that our guys get when they get to the college level about um, how to lift, what to lift, um, how to fuel their bodies, um, you know, nutrition, hydration, sleep, developing those habits at a really young age, I think would really benefit a lot of college players because sometimes they don't have them when they get to school and it takes them freshman year, sometimes sophomore year. And then all, by the way, the light bulb finally goes off their junior year. And then it's almost like it's too late. You know, you just missed out on two years and you could have been a much better athlete uh, or in much better physical condition, uh, which maybe would have made you a better, better lacrosse player. So that's a lot, but you know, it's definitely some, some areas that I would focus on. Absolutely. And I love that you guys encourage multi-sport athletes. However, it, it can be oh. tough for a multi-sport athlete to really get the exposure that a player who is concentrated on lacrosse would get. For example, you know, players in Texas here who play football, right? They have their games on Friday nights. It's tough for them to attend fall recruiting events. Do you guys take note and are pretty almost sympathetic to that, that you know they're probably not going to be at events? And does that kind of just, you know, do you still recruit them? Do you tell them, hey, we'll catch you another time or maybe come in January when your season's over? How does that process work with you guys? Yeah, I mean, if a kid is 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 elite enough at you know a football in Texas or something like that, I mean, you're just gonna obviously you're gonna stay with that kid. I mean, you may fill up your class, and you have to make that decision as a coaching staff. Say, hey, we really would like to recruit this kid, but at the end of the day, this kid over here that we know we like as well is saying, I want to come and I want to commit. So you have to make those decisions as they go. I do think that the kids that are are, are elite athletes that um, you know, have proven that maybe they're a little bit of a, a late bloomer or maybe they're going to take a little bit longer with their process. Schools will wait around for them. I mean, I think you see, you're seeing that right now with a lot of kids that are playing football that aren't doing fall across. Schools are kind of hanging back and waiting and waiting and waiting to say, hey, we'll wait till November. We'll wait till January. We'll wait till you're ready um, and kind of holding spots for those kids. Now, you may not, may not end up getting that kid at the end of the day, or you may be kind of forced to make a decision to, to either take someone or, or wait. But I do think if they're good enough, regardless of um, whether or not, you know, they can they can come and visit or do fall across, I think most of us would, would tend to wait on those kids because you do think when you project out to what they're going to look like when they're playing one sport in college, high-level athlete, you know, how, how much benefit there could be there. So I think we'd all be willing to wait. Yeah, their ceiling could definitely be higher. And – one thing you said earlier too is going on a little tangent, you know, understanding the sport when it comes to development of players. And as a high school coach, you know, youth coach, club coach, especially in a non traditional area here in Texas, I realize that most of the content consumed by young players and even parents are highlights, whether it's PLL highlights, MLL highlights, college highlights, or even their peers' highlights. And like, how do you think that affects the development of players? I mean, is it a negative thing where they don't see all the hard work that gets you up to that point and they're more worried about looking good than maybe being a productive player and an effective player? Or do you see it maybe as positive because, you know, more highlights, more content, you know, it gets guys excited, gets kids playing in the backyard. I mean, I can see it either way. I'm just wondering your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the latter, um, I would hope, would be, the way kids look at it, I mean, I think you see, I'm just, you know, like, is everybody going to be able to do this, the stuff that Lyle Thompson does that you see on YouTube and you see in, you know, on TV? No, that's not going to happen. I mean, he's learned how to do that over the course of his lifetime, and he does some things that majority of, of kids can't do. You know, is, is everyone going to be able to shoot like Mac O'Keefe? Maybe not. But I do think if they see it and it excites them and it makes them want to practice and try to, to emulate those guys, I, I can't see that as a negative. Um, yeah. I have three sons, and, like, my kids are seven, five, and three, and they're like, ah, oh, I'm going to try to be like Mac O'Keefe. And, <laughs> you know, they're, they're all right-handed, first of all. I'm like, fellas, he's left-handed. And, uh, you know, and they're trying to shoot in the backyard on the net trying to score goals, or they're trying to be grand aim and it throws skip passes, and, you know, it goes 10 feet over the guy's head. So they're trying. Um, so I do think it's, it's kind of a positive thing that they're trying to emulate these these unbelievable players that are doing things at an extremely high level. I mean, obviously the more TV coverage um, that the sport gets, the more it'll grow and the more, more kids will want to play that sport. 
Um, cause it is, it is extremely exciting when you watch it at the highest level. I mean, the PLL is obviously uh, a great opportunity for them to see that stuff, you know, more, so much more coverage of the college game through the big 10 network, uh, ESPN. I mean, that is just, it's just great to see the game growing and the ability for these kids to, to watch it now to play at that level and to do those things is going to take a lot of hard work and repetition, but yeah. um, at least if they're seeing and it's seeing and it's exciting them, that hopefully they'll, they'll want to do it in the future. Exactly. So kind of back to recruiting, when you show interest in a player who you're able to make contact with, let's say a 2021 this fall, what are some things you want to see from that player? And maybe a couple of things that players and parents listening right now can be aware of. Like, for example, I've heard coaches say, and you kind of said it too, is being honest and, you know, being yourself. Don't, you know, lead coaches on saying, oh, you know, I may want to go to Penn State. I might, I might. But, you know, if you're not actually considering Penn State, you're wasting their time. You're wasting your own time. Do you have any other advice? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the honesty piece is is, is huge, um, just so everyone's on the same page. I mean, it is, it is a challenging world. And again, we're, we do it. We have it on our side too. So there may be kids that say to us like, Hey, you're my number one choice. I'd like to be at Penn state and, and to be very honest with them to say, listen, we really like your game, but we have three or four other kids on our board that we think at this time are ahead of you. Um, I mean, those are challenging conversations to have and it may completely turn a family off, but we try to be extremely honest with everybody that we recruit. Um, the timeline of it is a real challenge. I mean, again, where everyone's coming out of the gates on September 1st, um, you know, the kids on your board that maybe are a couple notches down as far as the depth chart may be able to visit in the first week of September where the kid who's at the top of your depth chart, like you mentioned before, that the Texas kid who's got football might not be able to visit until, um, you know, December or January. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where, you know, someone who's a little lower on your depth chart of recruiting wants to, wants to come and you still want to wait and see if the kid in, uh, you know, later in the process can, can be on campus. So, it is a balancing act. I mean, I know it's hard on both sides. I mean, um, you know, we tend to sometimes lose some kids because we say, hey, we got to either see you play again or we're going to wait. Um, and then maybe that kid says, okay, well, fine, you want to wait? I'm going to go to this school over here. So you do run that risk a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, again, we want to we want to talk to coaches about kids and we want them to tell us, you know, that they, they are the right, the right fit for us because here's why. And, you know, some of the things that we definitely – want to hear is that this kid's an unbelievable worker um just absolutely relentless as far as his work ethic goes in school in lacrosse at practice football hockey you know lacrosse whatever he's doing he's working his tail off to be the best version of himself he's a great teammate he cares about his his um teammates in multiple sports you know he's always a guy that's going to go over and support a teammate you know pat someone on the back um you know he's gonna he's gonna be a great guy in the locker room um, you know, he's going to be a, a valued member of our team, whether it has anything to do with lacrosse or not. He's just going to be a great teammate to be around our, our facility. And then he's just going to be ultra competitive. And those are the things that we want to hear from coaches when we talk to them um, or what we want to see from these kids when we go out and evaluate. Are they those things? Are they are they working their butts off? Are they you know really good teammates that care about others, obviously, and then they compete as hard as they can um, to get the results that they get. So. Um, that's kind of where we would we would start with a lot of these kids. Let's say you find a recruit who is, you know, like what you just described, big time player, relentless, and you guys really want him and he's showing interest as well. However, he's also looking at, let's say, looking being looked at by Yale, Duke and Virginia, the other teams that made the final four this past year. What are some selling points about the Penn State program and even the college itself? that you maybe aren't going to find at these schools or most other schools? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, welcome to my life. That's what we're doing now in the last <laughs> month, just bumping into those four, three other schools. It's like, well, where do you want to go to college? It's like uh, Virginia, Yale, and Duke. It's like, okay, well, you just picked the, all the final four teams. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, no, I think for us at Penn State, I mean, we want to try to separate ourselves on a couple different, um, in a couple different areas. Um, you know, the, uh, the the total college experience is one of the things that we talk a lot about. Um, and with that, you know, you're talking about your academic experience, certainly an athletic experience, and then a social experience. Um, it's a it's a large university. It's 40,000 plus students. So there's, you know, a lot going on at a place like Penn State um, outside of just your daily routine of lacrosse and going to class. Um, 
from an academic standpoint, you know, you're going to have well over 100 different majors, 13 different academic schools. I mean, you name it, you can find it. You can create your own major at times. Um, you know, some of the, the, the most unbelievable academic facilities in the country, um, the academic support that these guys have as Division One athletes at a school like Penn State uh, in the Big Ten, um, you know, being a part of an athletic department that is, um, you know, willing to invest in these kids academically. You know, one of the one of the best um, schools in the country as far as graduation rates every year for student athletes. Um, so the academic piece is is huge. Um, you know, one of the things that we definitely push. Um, you know, some of the top programs in the country, uh, depending on the interest of the kid. The athletic experience. Um, again, you're at a school that. Most of the teams, I mean, 31 varsity sports, most of them in some capacity are competing for a national championship. Um, you know, you look what football is doing right now. Um, you look at the wrestling program. You look at women's soccer. Um, you know, you look at our program. You look at, um, you know, track and field. I mean, you go down the list. Most of these teams are competing for national championships, uh, yeah. pushing the envelope on the field. Um, the facilities are, in our opinion, second to none. Um, obviously, having Panzer Stadium now for us has been a huge addition. Um, they're going to play in world-class facilities and you're going to, you know, be one of 850 or so athletes at a place like Penn State that's that's playing in, in some of the best programs in the country. Um, and then the social side of things, I mean, there's just a lot to do. It's a college town. Um, you know, college town is attached to campus. Um, you know, you have major sporting events. You can go to a Penn State football game on a Saturday as a student athlete. You can go to a basketball game. You can go to ice hockey. Um, you, know, you can go to field hockey, women's soccer, whatever the case may be. And again, a lot of these teams are competing at the highest level. Um, you'll also have concerts roll through town throughout the year, um, probably a dozen or so that take place at the BJC that you can get access to. Um, tons of events throughout the year that are kind of yearly staples um, that allow you to have more than just school lacrosse. You know, you have other experiences here at a place like Penn State that, you know, allow you to have a total college experience and feel like you're part of a community. Um, which makes us a little bit different. So I do think those are some of the things we talk about when we when we target these recruits. I mean, largest alumni association in the country. Um, you know, unbelievable uh, mentor program within our own lacrosse program. So there's a lot of really um, great benefits to, to being at a place like this. And again, it's 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 a it's a 40,000 plus student school. So it's going to be definitely different than um, some of these other schools that you mentioned that are a little either on the smaller side, located in the city. Um, you know, yep. geographically a little bit further off, whatever the case may be. So we're just different in that regard. All right. Well, I'm a player and you just sold me with everything you said there. <laughs> and I just committed let's to go. Penn State. <laughs> how Great. do I, but let's say I'm a junior, right? 2021. How do I prepare to have success on and off the field for when I arrive on campus in the fall of 2021? Some of the stuff I mentioned before, um, you know, Again, we want to we want to recruit guys that are extremely hardworking and they're extremely competitive. Um, so again, just continuing to try to be the best version of yourself and everything you do is something that we're going to constantly um, push back on you. Um, you know, again, we're never going to tell a kid he's our number one recruit. We're just not going to do that. We're going to tell him when you get here, we're going to ask for your very best in everything that you do. Um, so if you have the tendency to either fade down the tail end of high school or you start getting senioritis, or you start, you know, you know, I'm not going to play football this fall. I'm just going to kind of hang out with my buddies. That's probably a major red flag for us. Um, we're going to try to, to encourage you to continue to play multiple sports, to continue to push yourself in the classroom, to continue to push yourself in the weight room. So it's not a shock when you get here, because um, that is a major jump, and most people don't realize it, especially at a place like Penn State, when you go from a high school of maybe a thousand students, where you're the man walking around campus. Um, you know, one of 250 in your class, and then all of a sudden you show up at Penn State and there's 40,000 of you walking around. Um, so it's definitely a major jump, um, nothing to fear. But if you're willing to just get up every day, work as hard as you can, you know, compete in everything you do, um, it becomes a lifestyle. And if it becomes a lifestyle in high school, you'll be just fine here. If it's something that you, you know, have a pseudo lifestyle, like sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, I would imagine you'll struggle playing for us and our coaching staff because those are the guys that uh, that tend to struggle with us. So, um, you know, I would just encourage you, you know, don't wait to be to be great at whatever it is that you do. You don't have to wait till you get to college to be a great anything um, player, son, brother, husband, you know, whatever it is, and uh, 
you know, just, just do the best job you can of forming habits that are going to benefit you down the road when you get to college. Yeah. And you, you touched on this a little, but when a player doesn't pan out for you guys, which happens at every school, what tends to be the reasons and maybe something players can prepare for kind of, as you just mentioned. Yeah. I mean, I think the work, the work ethic part of it for us has been one. I mean, if a guy's not willing to buy into a culture, um, you know, because they don't really work as hard as they should, or they're not really about the team. Um, those are probably the biggest reasons. I mean, it's pretty rare that kids want to leave a place like Penn State, um, whether they play or not. I mean, again, it's a t- college experience, so maybe lacrosse isn't going as well as you would have liked, but you can also still have 45 of your best friends around you every day. You can be in that locker room. You can, you know, have a great time on the weekends and through the whole football game. You know, you can do a lot of other things here while still, you know, fulfilling your obligations with us. Um, But if you're just, you know, if it's about you, if it's about playing time, it's like I don't really want to work that hard. I don't really want to do anything extra. Those are the guys that really tend to struggle within our culture. I think they get kind of weeded out. Um, Everybody's going to make mistakes. I mean, you know, the the transition from freshman year to sophomore year, sophomore year to junior year. I mean, these are all learning opportunities. And that's what college is about. But the guys that usually don't make it are the guys that early on aren't willing to buy into the culture that's already there. And it's unfair as a freshman, in my opinion, to go into a college locker room as a guy that maybe has only been there for a week, two weeks, two months, and not get on board with whatever that culture is. And maybe it's a culture yeah. you don't agree with, um, but if it's, a, if it's a strong culture and it's a culture built about the right things, I don't think you have the right as a younger guy to not get on board. Um, Now, if it's a culture that's not about the right things and you want to get out of that situation because it's not a good culture, then by all means, you should find a different place to go to school. But if it is about the right things, which we feel our locker room is about the right things, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to say like, Oh, well, I'm, I'm more important than that culture. It's more about me than it's about, about, about we and guys that are like that tend to struggle. Yeah. And that's, great advice for players when they are visiting schools or prospect days or whatever it is to take note of the culture. Is that something that they're going to be wanting to buy into when they're there? Yeah. And it could be as simple as, Hey, they, they practice in the morning. I'm not a morning guy. All right. Well then maybe that's not the right fit for you. You know what I mean? Or um, there's a lot of different things that, that go into it. And that's why both sides should do their research in this process. So when you get there, it's the right fit for the right reasons. All right, one final question for you. If you had every one of your future Penn State men's lacrosse players listening to this podcast right now, what would you tell them? Future Penn State lacrosse players, all the recruits? All the recruits from third grade to seniors in high school. Ah, oh, jeez. Now you put me on the spot here. <laughs> Take um, it any way I you think, want. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the one thing that I would probably stress the most is just be being a great person. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, it's like your lacrosse is going to be one part of your experience. Um, you know, academically, it's going to be one part of your experience. But, you know, when it's all said and done, if you can choose a place like Penn State and be here for the right reasons, go through it as a great person, someone that um, others will want to follow, um, someone that others will respect, someone that others will believe in because of the way you carry yourself, um, you know, not only when you're around the coaches or when you're around the facility, but all the time, um, 24-7, as if someone's always watching you. Um, that would be my suggestion. Is just make sure that you're doing um, all the little things in life that just, at the end of the day, this is, this is a great guy. Um, this is someone that I could I could see, um, you know, being a part of our team. So that would be the big one, just making sure your character is aligned with uh, your future goals. And if that's the case, then you'll find nothing but success at a place like Penn State. Well said. Pete Toner, Associate Head Coach, Penn State University. Once again, thank you for taking the time to come on. A lot of great info and, uh, you know, best of luck, obviously, with the rest of the fall here and into the spring 2020 season. Thanks, Luke. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Lacrosse Recruiting 101. Catch us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Have a question for Luke? Email them to questions at lacrosserecruiting101.com.